welcome to the Back Podcast, Australia's favourite gaming podcast. It's voted by us, the host of the Back Podcast, Australia's favourite gaming podcast. It's Monday the 5th of December 2022. I'm Nick Richardson and today I'm joined by Peter Panther Burns. Didn't think of the middle name. <laughs> and former tech journal and editor of Reckoner.com.au and also someone that Peter's written here, whom by fuck you should know what he does. I didn't write that. I, I wrote that. Okay, Raj wrote that. Raj. I forgot. I'm I like, g- if you guys don't know what I do by now, you never will. I forgot I gave you edit power on the document. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I was going ham on that document. <laughs> First mistake. Uh, Raj, <laughs> welcome to the show. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you for moving your entire life. Yeah, thanks, gents. What, 10 o'clock on a Monday morning? What, what more could people want, eh? <laughs> mm-hmm. I yeah, we feel that mistake just, every week. It's just the, worst. the question is why? Point. Like, what? What is that? That's a, a thing? great question. It's a great question. Um, and I'd love to answer that question off air. Um, you uh, are here on the show uh, now. Before <clears throat> we get into the nitty gritty of everything that's going on, um, Pete, you watched a movie this weekend? Oh yeah, yeah. I watched uh, Bruce Almighty. Uh, mm. Holds up. Holds up. Funny film. Uh, but one of the kind of main focuses of the, uh, the top of the film is uh, Bruce getting kind of harassed by his pager. Um, and that got us talking about, what the fuck is a pager? <laughs> yeah. So, Raj, you are the oldest person on this call. And Thank you. Yes. You're, you're also the most businessy. Did you have a pager? Because I can imagine a sort of 22-year-old Raj rocking a pager in the 90s, early 2000s. Oh, dude. Um, dude. And if you did, how do they work? Because to me, it's a little text message screen where you just got a bunch of text messages, but I don't know how you sent a message. So explain. Um, oh, wow. Jeez. One, I didn't have a pager. I'm not that old. Am I, uh, can I swear on this? Is this swear friendly? You can swear. It is, swe- it is All right, old man. Fine. All right. Thank, thank God. Um, I, 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 I've never owned it, but I do have like this little thing which sits on my belt that everyone thinks is a mm, pager. That's my, like, my insulin pump. Yeah. So everyone just assumes I'm like some surgeon that's wandering around town. Yeah. Um, especially at weddings because like it's out, like you can see it clipped onto the belt. Um, do you ever, but, do you ever uh, get in situations where someone has hurt themselves or is having a heart attack or something? <laughs> He's a doctor. Get in the house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then I go. Oh, I'm a doctor of history. Sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> but also, if there is a doctor here, I would love that because I'm severely diabetic. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, the best example of pages uh, for someone who never had a pager mm-hmm. uh, is the first season of The Wire. Go and watch the first season mm. of The Wire. Because uh, that is Pager Town. Pager Town. There are pages yeah, right. everywhere. Yeah. Um, and you don't want a page really in a cover cop. No. A little beeper no, going don't. off in the middle of a mob mob meeting. <laughs> it's more for the drug dealers. Yeah, okay. Um, You're still you, not you, explaining how it works. It would just send a message. So you would call a number. Yep. Call. And yeah, call a number. And uh i th- i think i think from memory it, you would get an operator who would like then type call xyz or whatever the message oh, was right. the short message oh my god and then that would ping onto the pager and you would read it um or if the operator wasn't there to do that it would just like ping your number or, and so like you might save a number against Fascinating. the name in your pager and then you would have to go to a payphone and call them like that. That's they were they were literally just a page, like a, a paging announcement in like a, a movie theater or a plane, like you know, or an airport where you know, Mister Richardson, come pick up, uh, you know, who the hell are you type of thing. Yeah, um, I, cool. That I all makes sense. The idea, <laughs> I love the idea of offloading the message writing to someone else. I wish we still had that. I mean, I guess I technically have Siri, who <laughs> does that for me. But I love the idea of being like, I want to text someone. Uh, take, take, take a, take a text, and then, I really just need an assistant. That's what I need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think because like the Telstra voice to text when you like call someone 
and it goes, you know, this message is going to be sent to the, this mm. person as a text message. Like that's essentially the pager service. Yeah, right. Okay. But did you have to say words. stop? <laughs> yeah. I, d- I don't know. <laughs> In Australia, Hello, Raj. I've stop. Never, never used one. What are you doing I today? No idea. Stop. <laughs> Now, I know that uh, I've watched movies where someone's got a, a, a paged message and it says like 911 and it's work, which means like there's an emergency at work, call work. In Australia, would we have written triple zero work? I just, I still, I would still write 911. Like if I, if there were, if I was paying per character, <laughs> I wouldn't write emergency. Um, I, I think writing triple zero would confuse everybody. It would, it would make me think, call triple zero. Whereas if someone said 911, I would be like, okay, there's an emergency. But you know what I mean? No. It doesn't, no. It's 911 in America and, and you just but, in, infer the meaning. Yeah, but you, SOS, yeah. snail says SOS, SOS would be good. Yeah. I've never written triple zero as some sort of like, there's an emergency, but I know I've written 911 at least once. Because it's, <laughs> it's the universal for America. No, it's not. You're just so caught up in American culture. You're drenched well, no, in it. I'm, I'm with Nick. <laughs> uh, it, right. Like it's it, except if if I got a triple zero, I'd be like, that is real. Someone that's dying right now. Yeah, like yeah. That, you know. Whereas nine one one is like, oh yeah, it's just a fake emergency. It's not a it's not a legit emergency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. like it, someone someone's we're out of A four paper for the printer. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nine one one. Roger wants fresh ink. Uh, <laughs> uh, did you, did you see that IT Crowd episode where they changed the number? The not like the UK number, and they had like this ad campaign, and they were changing right. it to like six four seven three five four <laughs> four right. four five six seven three two one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wonder how they landed on nine one one because it's like there must be a reason because triple zero makes sense because it's like triple zero is much better. Yeah, because it's just that. like you can spam it. Mm. You don't need to move. Like imagine, imagine if imagine if moving your finger up two rows would be the last amount of energy energy you had in your body and then you would die. So yeah. it's just like you just spam the zero. But I wonder how they landed on 911 as a stupid number. I, th- I think it's because it you can't spam it. That's like a, mm, an you can't accidental act, you can't thing. Butt dial it. Oh. Whereas like kids can just, hit, you know, smash three buttons in a row and get whatever. Yeah. Interesting. I, I mean, I'm just... I'm, I'm at, yeah. And, uh, and that's how you that's how you accidentally dial triple zero, isn't it? Stabbing in the dark. Stabbing in the dark. <laughs> yeah. And that's also why you need to dial triple zero. <laughs> Stabbing in the dark. Uh, good. Okay. This has all been very useful. Um, Raj, do you have anything else you want to say? Uh, fuck you. All right. Let's get started because Peter's news isn't going to break us up. <laughs> Up is presented by one of our top stitch patrons, the best evil person we know, Pete Barber, who, yes, has lived a very <laughs> sad evil? life, but did not, did not take enough off the top. Come on. Pete, you've had two haircuts in a week. I know. That's more than I have in a year, typically. I know. That's a, there's so many haircuts. <laughs> and it cost you a total of $70. Yeah, it did. Yep. It did. Bullshit. Um, I think that yeah, that's that's that is a bullshit. But you look great. Oh, wait, enjoy the call this morning. I'm like, did you get another haircut? You're like, I'm full of them. <laughs> I'm so I'm so full of cuts. It's still uh, so much hair there. Isn't uh, sorry, I'm talking about Evil Spy Boy. Get your exclamation back, Spy Boys, out in the chat because thanks for generous Patreon support. Evil Spy Boys bring you the backup. He's helping you bring generosity. Food Bank Australia. Food Bank provide regular breakfast more than 132,000 students at schools across the country. And on top of this, more than 200,000 kids seek food relief from their charities every single month. Head donate at foodbank.org.au. <laughs> Nightbot has a link there right now. And head to tastemultifish.com for more information about Evil Spy Boys' proclivities. <sighs> I realize I talk naturally fast anyway. So when I appear on another podcast and it's listening at like one and a half speed or double speed, like I, I already sound terribly sped up, whereas this is a disaster. Can I go Let's on another tangent? Please. I had a friend in school. Uh, he was the drummer in my band. He was unintelligible. So, so many questions. He was unintelligible. Yeah, I know. I know. We'll get to that. Uh, yeah, like uh, <laughs> he would just it, it was he a slow speak talker, so a quickly, a fast talker, and yeah. just like and had sloppy Here's lips. An example: it's sloppy lips. So mm. it, it, he would go. Guess we're going to go and get get some pies or something. It's like what? What the fuck did you just say? It's like so the the, the like, strategy that we developed for him because he's a drummer was to just tap his mm. foot 
at a slow tempo and talk to <sighs> talk to the beat. So maybe you should be doing that on other podcasts. So we, That's a and he did. Move. He got way better just by doing that. And he would. And a he's a pilot move. now, and so <laughs> we were like, he still uses that method when he's doing PAs. Well, I was going to say, being a pilot, uh, <clears throat> they're the slowest talkers I've ever heard. <laughs> like uh, pilots, well, they're not slow. They just so they put gaps. they put pauses in. Yeah. What are they doing? They're not concentrating on anything. Planes fly, apply them, fly themselves these days. I know. Or, yeah, or they're talking into a microphone unintelligibly. Oh, uh, un- what? What's the word? They can't. You can't understand. It's like. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, all the gentlemen. Uh, as well. We're pulling into Melbourne, and um, we'll be landing in the next fifteen minutes. Uh, the weather down there is. A nice 30 degrees Celsius for you all. I hope you brought uh, some shots and uh, we'll be uh, spending about five minutes on the taxiway and uh, thank you for flying with Qantas. Uh, Hope you have a lovely visit in Melbourne and um, we'll see you soon. <laughs> was that when you when you're a kid, Pete? Was your dad you to brush your teeth with the same sort of like yeah. cadence? No, nah, my dad's pretty bogan. It's definitely an affectation that they have mm-hmm. that pilots have. It's like a yeah. learned yeah, right. way to communicate, just to get information across. They need to sound calm so that the yeah. passengers are calm. It's like it's a it's a it's Whereas- a voice. If Pete's dad did his normal voice over the comms, it'd be like, ah, oh, g'day, you can't How the fuck uh, y'all going, right? We're coming down pretty fucking hot. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, had a big night last night. Uh, still feeling the effects of it. It's going to be a bumpy landing. Now, that is the honest truth. <laughs> uh, all right, let's back up and look at the biggest stories of the week as voted on by us, the host of the backup, where we back up and look at the biggest stories of the week. And Raj, start us off with a story that made you back up this week and say, hey, that's a pretty big story. I am going to kick the things off with a story about City Project Red and um, Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Potentially oh, contribute best financial that. results. Maybe. Oh, that. did I cut out? Yeah, you, we lost you for a sec. Oh, okay. Am I back? You're okay. back now. Tell us about Edge Runners okay. being the most financially successful thing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, like, City Project Red, who came off the back of... Um, uh, you know, some pretty wishy-washy reviews on uh, on Cyberpunk have like they they've now somehow managed to deliver like the best financial quarter ever. Was it mm. like th- I think their third th- best ever, third best ever. Yep, the best no best third quarter no, best in their entire quarter. history. <laughs> yeah, come on, Pete. Sorry, um, fifty four point three million dollars in revenue. And then twenty one point eight million in net profit. Like that's a fifth, like fifty percent profitable company. In a, I know it's over a quarter, but that is an insane percentage to have for for a big corporate, like well, or a, or a small group, I guess, in comparison to. I mean, some it would others. be massive so- for us. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, that would be a monstrous quarter for <laughs> for low key. Like absolutely huge. Um, so and like they're putting a lot of this. Like down to um, edge runners coming out, and um, a lot, you know, obviously they've been working on Cyberpunk for a very long time, well, for a long time since its release, and they're staying sort of true to their word and not charging for all those updates and fixes and things like that. But despite it getting such poor reviews, like at least 20 million copies of Cyberpunk in September, like, oh, sorry, surpassing reached, 20 million yeah. total. So, like, that, that's that's some big biscuit numbers, like, that's huge. I, I watched Ed Runners. And I gotta, I gotta admit, uh, like I enjoy the odd anime or, or here and there, but I wasn't. Nothing about this made me want to go back and play the game. Yeah, yeah, fair. Like, um, and, and I haven't even played the game yet. So, like, I bought it, and it was so bad that I just, all right, I'm just going to leave this for a couple of years and come back to it. But yeah, I, I, I just wasn't spurred on. So I don't know. Like, I know, I know you played the game, Pete. Yeah, but. Did you watch the the show? Did it make you want to jump back? Uh, I I only watched a couple of episodes of the show, uh, and it didn't make me want to jump back. But I have jumped back into Cyberpunk a couple of times as patches have come out. Um, yeah, yeah. The show didn't do much for me, but I don't really do anime. Um, so 
I'm not really one to judge it. So it, it, it looked cool. It was just like a cartoon about a dude who's angry and pulls people apart. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> the show is fucking amazing. Um, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, what, yeah. What, what, it, tell, tell me why. Cause... It was just uh, uh, so thematically it was totally my shit. Uh, like it was uh, incredibly self-destructive man. Uh, it goes to save the people that he loves while getting yoke, and that's just me. Um, the uh, but visually, I mean, it was it had so much fucking style and personality, and just a bold. It just had so much boldness. It just fucking it. It just like came in and was like. I'm going to assault you for 22 minutes at a time and you're just going to sit here and take it because this is what you want. Uh, it has one of the best, most romantic scenes in any piece of media ever on the moon. <laughs> uh, it is just it is just a phenomenal show. But I think it's it, it, the, the cyberpunk turnaround has just been one of those stories where it was like, for so many years, we wanted this game. Everyone was so excited. Game came out. There has never been a like potentially one of the most. I would say one of the most disappointing game releases of all time. In, if you compare like hype to reception, yeah. Um, and then a commitment from CD Projekt to keep trying to fix it, fix it, fix it. And then the anime came around, and it, I think it just like. They must have just been fixing so much stuff in the background to make the game run well, I suppose. Uh, it, you sort of like achieve the thing that they set out to, or uh, to achieve the thing that it <coughs> was in the first place because they didn't really change the story and the narrative and the, the way that, like the kind of game that it is, they just made it way more functional. But the anime had so much got so much love that then so many people are discovering the game for the first time and now discovering the game and going, oh, yeah, this isn't bad because it's, it's a pretty good game now. Uh, it, like, it at least boots. It at least boots. <laughs> and it is amazing that th this is the second time this fucking company have done this. Like, they have The Witcher as well. It is wild that they have the two, anim they, they have the two uh, like, TV shows that have made people fall in love and rediscover video games. And it's from the same goddamn company. <laughs> All they need to do, like, I cannot imagine they will ever put out a game without some amazing television show being released alongside of it because it just seems like this is now, this is the CD Projekt Red formula. Like, put out the thing, make the cross-media thing actually work in a way that uh, companies have been trying to for years uh, and continue to just print money. And now the narrative around Cyberpunk is, oh, it's the little, it's the scrappy game that could. It's like No Man's Sky. It's like, oh, they did it. It's and now they've got single player DLC coming out next year, and they, they released. They said that we're we're working on the sequel after we're going to put out another five fucking Witcher games. Uh, it's wild. It is wild that this company has have done this fucking twice. Worth pointing out though that they weren't at all involved in the Witcher TV show, but they no, benefited no, 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 but, hugely no. from it. Yes, um, totally. And yeah. and they would have commissioned this cyberpunk TV show well before the Witcher saw success it wasn't like a reaction to that it was like they were ahead of that um in commissioning this show so and i would also say they should have worked on the witcher tv show because i've watched that show that show is not very good uh whereas oh, come on come this, on Nick. this show is great it is it's <laughs> such basic bitch fantasy and it is so it is so hammy. It's like everyone, you, like everyone is just in dress up. It's just lame. It's got a Hemsworth now. No. <laughs> well, yeah, that's 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 another story. But like, I, I remember reporting on Edge Runners like back when when I was doing this more often, and and being at E three and watching like the cyberpunk demos and being so excited. But uh, I, I like the the f I guess folly with the cyberpunk. Launch. like isn't this kind of the second time they've done this as well like by making the game better later on like shouldn't they getting things right every game they've ever the put beginning? out nah. is broken at the beginning <laughs> they then yeah. fix it with patches release a tv show announce 14 sequels these yeah, and these poll these polls know what the fuck they're doing <laughs> which is <laughs> which is clever but like i just i'm so surprised that people are still on board well, you 
I don't know. Like you made The Witcher three. I think you can kind of get away with it. They, they got an, they got another two games that can. They be made one and two, and out. now they're remaking one as like an open world, right? So they kind of yeah. I mean, two was great, but one one they made one when no one knew who they were, so it was like true, like, true. Yeah, one's 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 not particularly fun. I'm sure the remake will be good, but sorry, yeah. no. I just I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to think about why because as RK Blob puts in chat, have you seen Bethesda fans? Bethesda get a lot of free passes from fans of their games because of how far they reach for doing something massive and new with open mm. worlds. Like, and not necessarily new, but bigger than ever before is always the Bethesda thing. Um, so when there's bugs, you're like, yeah, there's bugs. And when I hit this troll, he goes flying into space. But uh, this is the biggest world I've ever been in. And I mean, look at 76. Look how, how bad that was. Well, yeah, I mean... I don't think that would that that was kind of the unforgivable people t- turned against Bethesda after that one, but um, CD Projekt they have good faith, I think, because of The Witcher Two feeling like this success out of Poland, you know, not a known region for competing with the AAA game development market, and The Witcher Two really blew people away, and then The Witcher Three was a lot of people's game of the year. They followed up and kind of cemented themselves. And yes, again, <clears throat> even if it was buggy at launch, people look at these guys and go like, you get a you get a pass for being this team that is succeeding where you shouldn't. You know, you get a, you get a pass for not being EA or Activision. Um, yeah. So I think people endeared themselves to to CD Projekt in that era. And they still have it. It still lingers on. And it doesn't matter how much they fuck up. As long as they're, uh, they're really kind of um, open with the communication, I think they'll be able to, it, it, no matter how much they fuck up, if they, go, if they, if they do right in the end and they, and they communicate well, which they've done since the launch of um, Cyberpunk, you know, they've, they've, uh, they've fallen on their sword very publicly. Um, they were forgiven pretty quickly for that. So for the for the launch of twenty seventy seven. So yeah, I think I think, I think that, that yeah. Go ahead. Well, with the Bethesda thing as well, and The Witcher, I think the the unforgivable thing with Cyberpunk, and it wasn't actually un- unforgivable is a very strong word, but the difference between that and like a Bethesda game or something is that most of the time when Bethesda put out something that's janky and buggy, it's still doing something that no one else is really doing. And it's it's pushing that genre forward in some way. Mm. Now, I don't particularly like Bethesda games. I just don't really like big open world games. But I can look at something like Skyrim or Fallout and go, oh, yeah, you're just like the scale on which you're operating on in terms of just like gameplay potential, storytelling in this game, world building, player freedom is so much bigger than anyone else. So you get a pass for just like trying something that big and then it's like, okay, now go fix your game. Yeah. And the biggest, I think the biggest thing with Cyberpunk was that it came out, it was it was super difficult to play on anything that wasn't a monster, cons- a monster PC. <clears throat> but it also didn't really feel like it was pushing forward the genre in a particular way. Like the the quest design was very open world quest design. It looked great, but it was just like, oh, there's nothing, there's not that thing here where it's like, this is going to change games forever. It's like, no, this is kind of like the shiniest version of this thing that we've seen. Uh, And so, whereas like The Witcher 3, the storytelling in Witcher 3 was just so much more nuanced than most of the things that we had been seeing beforehand. The scale of that game was so huge uh, and and the characters were so, not necessarily deep, but just like, fascinating i suppose uh that they, they got away with a lot uh even though it was a bit buggy so yeah but it is incredible that the, this anime has basically turned that the uh, the tide on reminding people that this game is good and i never finished it i've uh, because of the anime i installed it and i'm gonna probably play it over the christmas break that's gonna be one of my christmas games because i'm keen to go the, and check it out one of the main reasons i want to check it out again is or 
check it out. And not that I have a 4090, but like the the reviews that I'm hearing of what this game looks like on some of that top end hardware now is is just phenomenal. A fucking Keanu Reeves dick <coughs> in uh, yeah. with at least a 3080 is <laughs> just gonna blow my mind. <laughs> Wait, uh, what's that hello sky game um no man's sky no, no man's sky, sky. Hello, no man's sky. Hello, like that 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 is the epitome of like releasing a low expectations and then blowing everyone out of the water it just takes five years to get yeah there. yeah right. i mean it's uh, are I, they gonna make an anime they should <laughs> yeah i think they are <laughs> they <should>. <laughs> yeah i thought there was i thought there was a tv show coming yeah. in this guy yeah there is um uh yeah but i, I would say in defense of uh no man's sky that game was fully functional when it came out. It was just not super feature rich. Um, yeah, it, it, it just had that that recorder version of the Jurassic Park theme playing over the top exactly, of it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but it was it's amazing that they had an opportunity to keep working on that game and make it the kind of fully fleshed out monster that it is today. Um, I guess I guess the one the one thing, and we got to move on. But like the yeah. one thing that you do get if you have in the same way as No Man's Sky did and Cyberpunk, which is just unending hype for your game, building and building pre-release, is you get so much fucking money on day one that you can't afford to go, okay, we're spending the next five years. We can ride this for a while. Like, yeah, totally. Like it's it if you if you build that hype. So maybe that's the thing. Maybe if you're like, <clears throat> we we have we have targets to hit, this game EA said this game has to come out. All we have to do is just build hype to an unrealistic expectation. People will kill us online for years, but we will have enough money to be able to fix this game before um, before we uh, need to move on to the next one. That's, <laughs> that's the that's the baller move. And if we don't, we just all cash out and go to the Bahamas. Uh, Peter, what story caught your eye this week? Yeah, so this is a um, a bit of a change of pace. <laughs> um, uh, Andrew Wilkie, a federal independent politician has um, proposed an amendment um, for a bill that will uh, restrict loot boxes in video games in the country um, following other countries like Belgium and Netherlands who have implemented um, similar restrictions like this. So the uh, he proposes that loot box mechanics where players use actual money to buy random in-game items prey upon the same impulses that gambling does and that they can serve as a pathway to get get kids hooked. He suggests that any game with loot boxes or similar systems should not only be restricted to those over the age of 18, but should carry warning labels specifying the reason for the rating as well. Um, I, uh, and let me pull, there was a paragraph from the actual uh, document itself. Um, Loot boxes not currently... uh, Further, the board must set a minimum classification of R18 plus or uh, refuse classification for games containing this feature. Um, so you could be you could be Candy Crush, <laughs> but if you had loot boxes, you your game would be rated R18. Correct. Uh, loot boxes, I feel like, are less of a talking point today than they were yeah. three or four years ago. Um, they're they're definitely less prevalent in shooters and stuff that are releasing today but that's not to say that they've disappeared um i mean <clears throat> they're still effectively in you know any card game that you're buying a deck of cards and it's random what's in it uh dota has treasure chests that you open and they have random loot in them um i <laughs> i guess ea's um fifa f- foot as well would mean that every fifa game would become an r18 plus game um which ea would not be happy about uh i think it's 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 a good thing to be looking at predatory systems that gaming has kind of normalized or video game gaming normalized and now video games are, mm. have started to normalize over the last few years <sighs> It's, I think it's probably a good pressure for the government to be putting on. I don't know that it will have any effect. You know, uh, when you look at the countries like the Netherlands have implemented this stuff um, and the Dota, the Steam's Valve's reaction to that was they just show you what you're going to get out of the loot box before you roll it. But it's still effectively the same thing in that 
because it's a client, uh, it's a user based uh, uh, random role, it's already predetermined before you buy the thing anyway. So you can see the thing you're going to get, but the next time, so you buy it and you get that. And then it will randomly choose the next thing that's also an mm. option available in that kit. So it's effectively the same thing. You can just see what you're getting before you buy it yeah. and roll again. Um, so, th like, ultimately, the systems are not being changed and or, or dis discarded. They're just being tweaked in order to appease governments around the world. So I don't know that changing anything in Australia is going to change anything. But I think pointing the finger back at developers and going, like, do what's morally right is, is, a, is a good thing for governments to be doing, even if they can't have any m massive impact on the in industry itself. Thoughts? <laughs> hmm. Look, um, I just, uh, Raj, do you have something fascinating? Uh, not, not super fascinating. No. I, like for me, it's more around. I think Pete's right. Like I, you, you see or hear less about loot boxes, more like uh, less and less now, I guess. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Different forms of varieties. What does seem to be more prevalent these days that I see is in-game currencies, or um, essentially making you buy into that ecosystem to mm -hmm. then buy into buy the credits whether it's the credits yeah whether it's a loot box or a, an actual item or whatever um that that sort of like dual layer currency and microsoft were guilty of this back in the old x where they had the game uh, points or whatever it is to actually buy stuff to to offend, essentially mean that you never end up with a zero credit mm. um and you you have to top it up like else then um that type of system i think is something i would like this type of bill to go deeper on rather than just keep it at a loot box level um mm. but I definitely agree with that because like what other i can't think of any other platform or anything where except for like shitty um fun arcades where real money I mean, maybe yeah. Disney. Like, real money is not accepted. <laughs> like, you need to buy fake money with your real money to then buy things. And like you said, that that loop that you get stuck in. Mm. It's is... kind of like um, frequent flyer points or flybys points. Like, you, you sort of have these this faux currency that you can top up to, like, buy the rest of your fly, like points and pay and stuff. Yeah. I would love, um, though, I've got, like, 170 thousand frequent flyer points i would love if i could funnel those into marvel snap <laughs> and like, and it, that would be great um it, it seems weird the the weird thing about this because i agree i think that that sort of currency stuff i fucking hate as well um i don't know about the idea of making them just automatically r18 uh i suppose it's i suppose it's like shock and awe of just going like all right if you want to do this, we're going to make it so difficult for people to, particularly because like a lot of these games are games that kids play, like mm. FIFA, Roblox has tons of their stuff in it. Um, so you know you would you're effectively saying parents have to have to go, oh, this is an R18 game, and probably not look at anything else <clears throat> um, about why it is. But it seems weird that I don't know, like whether there's a way that you can control in game. Like in order to purchase loot boxes, you need to verify your identity as being eighteen, as opposed to like putting the whole like putting the whole game under the blanket of that. But then I guess the point of doing that is to try to like force developers to just not put it in the first place. Yeah, it just seems to be it just, that just seems like a weird, a weird jump um, to do uh, because while it's while it is, a, I guess technically gambling, it's not like I don't think. I could be wrong, but like I don't think people go to a video game that has loot boxes to buy loot boxes. They want the thing in the game, and loot boxes is the way that they need to interact with the game in order to get it. If you know what I mean, like they're not going there. <clears throat> broadly speaking, necessarily for the thrill of the loot box, that's a byproduct of them wanting the skin or the card or whatever. I mean, devil's advocate, you can look at things like, um, uh, like. Uh, pet toy box subscription services so you can pay 
20 bucks a month and get a box in the mail for your dog or cat or something, which has an un- Yeah, just random shit. Set of- yeah. 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 Now, is am I gambling by, by buying a um, surprise box for my pet? Technically, yeah. Like it could be, <laughs> it could be one piece of like play shit, like, or it could be a, a whole bunch of good stuff. But you, you, I guess you kind of know it's going to equate to the value of whatever it is that you're paying to that mm-hmm. box. Whereas a loot box, if it's a rare item, so you could potentially on sell that maybe, and it's worth a lot more. Same as like trading cards for basketball and things like that. Um, I get, I, I like the intent of it. Um, but I think it's just going to result in like exactly what Pete was talking about with the Netherlands and, and they'll just switch that mechanic because they can't have it. Like they can't make everything. I mean, like it, yeah, it, it, that it's a loophole to get around it. Yeah. 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 It's weird. Can't yeah. Weird. I mean, this is not a, this is not an amendment that has passed. It has just been proposed, um, a couple of days ago by Wilkie. So, um, don't you love that Australia's way of dealing with anything with video games is R18? R18. That is just mm. our <laughs> default. Like, got a problem with video games? Put an R18 on it. Uh, that's just the only way that we that uh, that anyone who doesn't play video games can interact with video games is adults only. Uh, yeah, it's it's we're very we got we got to come up with something better than that. It's, <laughs> we're beginning we're beginning to be the joke of the world. Um, <clears throat> Cool. Uh, my story is uh, much lighter than than that one, uh, and that is that future DC video games uh, coming out are going to be part of the larger DCU, DCMU, maybe just DCU because it's video games as well, uh, that James Gunn is putting together. So James Gunn, <clears throat> director of Guardians of the Galaxy, Galaxy uh, has recently been appointed as being the Kevin Feige of uh, Marvel, uh, sorry, of DC, Kevin Feige sort of in charge of putting together the MCU and and they're looking to get James Gunn to do a similar sort of thing so that all the DC films that come out are connected. Uh, and he gave me an uh, interview and he was talking about how the some of the video games or most of the video games are also going to be connected to that universe as well, which is... Uh, I mean, they've been talking about trying to get a DCU uh, movie universe going for a while. There's been a couple of times and it's always been bad because they keep trying to do it like that as opposed to letting it sort of like have the actual building blocks. They keep just trying to jump to it's the team up movie. And it's like, but who are the fucking people? Uh, (laughs) I don't know. Like, why do I care about any of these people? Because you just put them all in a movie together and each of them only got seven minutes screen time. Them trying to tie video games into a film universe or make all video games connected in some way. I don't like this idea because it just, it feels very restrictive. I think that the, funnily enough, DC have had a pretty good track track record of of video games. Like I love the, you know, the Arkham series, for example, just phenomenal series of of video games. Um, But it's weird because you look at, when I look at DC movies, I think that one of the strengths of DC is when they just do their own standalone things. Like I didn't like Joker, but lots of people liked Joker. And I at least appreciated what Joker was doing as being this completely new take on what the Joker is. Uh, the Batman, the the one with, um, with uh, Ro- uh, Ro- Pat. Robert Pattinson. Yeah, like one of the one of the better received Batman films since we left the Nolan verse, uh, and you know is doing something very different than what we'd been seeing before with um, Batman and Superman and all that sort of stuff. You don't sort of get those things when you get to just have uh, when everything needs to be connected. And I feel the same with the video games. Um, Raj, I don't know about you. How do you, how do you feel about the idea that all the DC video games you'll be playing? will have ties to the other games and the films and the TV show and the anime and the podcast and the audiobooks. Uh, I think you forgot the TikTok accounts. Um, and the TikToks. <laughs> socials. Uh, yeah, cool, I guess. I don't know. It's like it, it's, it's a, it's, for me, it's a huge case of like, look at what Marvel are doing and how successful they are. Why aren't we sharing in the glory dollars of what they're doing? Um, and I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why, because the DC stuff's been so up and down. Um, there really isn't a single DC like property that I've enjoyed since The Watchmen. 
And I think that's probably because I'm just a, more of a fan of that graphic novel than I am any of the others. Um, not because Snyder did a better job on it or anything. There was a terrible um, hallelujah sex scene, for example. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's so strange, right? Uh, yeah, it's terrible. Um, but uh, I rewatched that movie a couple of months ago. By the way, it is. I mean, the source the source material is the same. It is so nihilistic. <laughs> it is the most de- depressing outlet. I loved it when I saw it the first time because I was tortured and <laughs> I was just like, "We're rewatching it now." I was just like, "Oh my god!" Like this this film hates its characters so much. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But if you want, if you want uh, a really good TV show, totally tangent. The Watchmen TV series was incredible. Oh, was so good, a- absolutely incredible. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, look, I, I, I think, yeah, it's really about DC setting themselves up to sort of copycat Marvel and and try and get that fan engagement going. To you know, oh, you know, what what are they going to announce at what is it Disney Con or whatever it is that D Day um that they have and like this is the roadmap of films and properties and things coming out like they want to capture that same level of engagement to to uh allow them to have some forgiveness in what they put out because not (laughs) some of the marvel stuff is utter rubbish (laughs) yeah totally (laughs) it is absolute garbage but people give it a huge like pass because it does sort of interweave into this Mm -hmm. giant universe exactly Mm -hmm. um it's like whereas strange was it was palatable because of how it talked to you could you could theorize about what that was going to mean for the other characters that you actually like yeah yeah um so i, I it, it's it's the business move more than anything and as james gunner at the helm look he's done really well with um guardians of the galaxy you can pull it out across the entire dcu that's a, that's a big uh, responsibility that Feig's done <clears throat> an incredible effort uh, with on the Marvel side. So, I mean, good luck to him. I hope I hope he can uh, for all those DC fans out there because I think they're all kicking and screaming and wanting something that really does tie things. Yeah. Um, can you believe some of them uh, are so deluded that they think Zack Snyder's uh, films are worth, like... <laughs> rallying for i mean uh, potentially <laughs> I, I, I don't know how how long snyder's contract is that his first move like just to to cut that yeah. I, I haven't watched any of the justice league stuff like and i've got no interest in the snyder cuts of them or or any in any of that um I've, i have heard that the was it the latest suicide squad was okay um which was like directed it, by I james gunn yeah. yeah so you know that gives me i I almost clicked on play for that one. <laughs> the, yeah, that's, I love that you're like, I nearly watched it, so yeah. we're getting closer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the stank is starting to wear off. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hey, do you um, like the idea of like all the video games being <clears throat> the same, the same characters, the same takes? Um, oh, I'm o- yeah. I'm okay with it for the immediate future where they where they have a lot of catch up to do in terms of like. <clears throat> getting a lot of characters out in front of you to build up a care from the audience. Cause I don't care about any DC characters. And, and like, I like, I'm oh, sorry. I care about, I like Batman. Batman's fucking awesome. He's probably awesome. the best superhero, but because he's got the DC like marker at the front of his name now, it's like, yeah. Oh, but it's, but he's DC. You almost just want to take dirty Batman and, and put him in New York. Or Dark Horse with, Comics or something. Just move him to Marvel. Yeah. Like have him sort of like switch allegiances. Which, of course, I don't want that to happen. I think the DC universe should succeed, should give be given the opportunity to succeed. I think James Gunn is probably a good person to do that because he approaches things with levity. I the, yes. Like the, the Guardians of the Galaxy aren't my f- favourite marvel films but i see why they work for so many people suicide squad exactly the same thing i didn't love it but it was the most palatable dc movie that i saw in that universe of the justice leaguey kind of universe um, and it has a strong identity <clears throat> has a strong identity and i think the show about um uh john cena's character which i watched the first few episodes of that i was like yeah cool this tone carries through into this television show really well i think like 
it, it's just been so long since we've seen playful humor in DC, even in Nolan's universe. If there was a joke, it was like a dark wit as opposed mm. to uh, fun, energy and fun. The Justice League films pretended that they were funny, but they didn't. They weren't at all. Um, they were just so unbearably cringe to use my word of the day because the kids taught me. Um, so <laughs> I think Gunn, while again, like not necessarily perfectly aligned with my sense of humor, I think he has what it takes to be broadly appealing and also care about the characters enough to make us care about them. So I'd love to see what he does. And I don't think he's not going to direct everything, but hopefully he builds a team of directors and people around him that can make these projects work for broader audiences um, because the idea of going into the fucking incel Snyder verse just like I think turned most sane people off DC. Um, yeah. And it was just this hardcore, just desperate DC fanboy group that just accepted Snyder and and put him on a pedestal because he was making DC films, not because they were good, but because they were getting made. Uh, so I'm glad to see, I hope this means we won't see Snyder direct another film ever again, <laughs> but <laughs> at least I hope that he's sent away from directing DC films. Snyder verse is done. The gun verse is here. The uh, gun verse. The gun verse is here and I'm way more hopeful for what DC can produce out of that. The, the I, I agree. Like I think that James Gunn is someone who has just more vision um, than Snyder, who seems to again like all of his films are about characters. He like he hates all the characters in all of his films. He's never made a yeah. film where he he's like it's so masturbatory. Deserve, they deserve to be saved and loved and cared for. He's like no, everyone yeah. must be tortured until they die. Um, so I'm definitely, I like James Gunn's take on everything. The two, I guess the two things that I'm, I'm curious as to how this will work in, in terms of the video games. One, I just don't like the idea of there being one version of Batman or sure. one, ver like it, it needs to stay canon or, or consistent with like what's in the film. So it's, it's kind of like, it's almost like, you know, I don't, I don't know. And, and this could work in any way. And they did say that there will be some outlier cases, but it's like, I can't imagine that the video game is going to be the one leading the the take for what the film is going to be like. It's going to be the other way around. So they're going to make a, a Batman film and then whatever version of Batman is in that movie is kind of now the version of Batman in the video games, which then just very much railroads you into a tone of a video game that needs to be the same as the film. So I'm a little bit wary about that because yeah. I think that Batman is a great example of being, because he is my favorite superhero as well, and he has tons of versions of him that are all like the fun, playful uh, sort of um, uh, more like uh, uh, the, there was the um, uh, like there's Batman, the animated series, which is like dark and mm. um, uh, gritty. There's Batman, the, all the like serious Batman stuff we know, but there was a brilliant Batman TV show uh, and it was called, and I'm getting it right now. Uh, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. The Penguin uh, one? It was not the, the Cape Crusader. Uh, Batman, the Brave and the Bold, which was this fun, uh, like funny, more like not kid focused, but certainly just more playful version of Batman that mm. was more like the sort of old, old, old school style Batman TV show. The Harley Quinn TV show is fucking hysterical. Uh, uh, but then, you know, if they decide to do that, then all the Harley Quinn games need to be funny. And so then you don't get, you know, it just sort of, I feel like it railroaded you a little bit. Um, the other thing is games take so much longer to make than films. So it's like how you how you keep up with if they're doing the DCU in the same way that Marvel <laughs> do their thing in the space of five years that it'll take you to make one video game. It's like you've put out 12 movies uh, and they've all informed the characters in different ways and changed. So yeah, it's just going to be interesting to see how they do it, I suppose. But um, yeah, but yeah, like you said, I like James Gunn. So if you would put anyone in charge of it, I think I would put little Will in charge of it first. Yeah. And for someone else, I'd probably put James Gunn. <laughs> uh, all right. That is literally all the video game news that happened this week. There's nothing else you need to know. <laughs> <laughs>